It is Wednesday, October 31st, 2018. It is 8 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, and so you know what time it is. It's time for a little bit of coin metal. <sighs> and I just got out of the shower, so I'm not as focused on how good of a ju- did a day at jiu-jitsu it certainly was, but it was. It was very good. Um, we did some interesting stuff from the... Um, uh, pardon me. I'm having a brain fart here, and it's... It's, it usually happens when somebody gets me in a half-decent choke at the end. <laughs> Either that or we choke a little bit too hard during drilling. Um, uh, but anyway, yeah, we did some interesting stuff in jiu-jitsu today. I'm sorry I'm not like right on the ball with exactly what it was. But uh, yeah, I've had a, a, a little bit longer to not think about it, you know, where it's a little bit further away. But I, um, I did have the interesting experience of rolling with um, somebody new today. And um, I have to think that he he at least trained at some point or another with somebody because I don't know he he there's just some little intuitive signs I had that you know he was either in wrestling or uh, some other martial art pro- possibly either judo or in fact jujitsu um, you know like if he was doing uh, no gi jujitsu and then tried gi jujitsu that's kind of how it felt while I was rolling with him. Um, but anyway, uh, today I tried to apply a bit more technique. Um, we were just positional sparring and uh, and uh, doing, you know, almost a almost a flow roll, but a little bit above that as far as intensity goes. Um, and that that was the other thing I was pretty impressed with his control, you know, because he did he did lose it a couple times, but. I, I could tell by the way he was sensing what I was doing. It's like, okay, he, he knows to look for the choke. He knows to look for the collar choke, you know, and watch out for the hand sneaking up on him, you know, uh, watch out for the arm going over the over the back of the tricep there, trying to catch the wrist underneath, you know, watch out for that kind of stuff. So I, I got the impression that this is not his first go around on the on the mat. Um, and so, and he was kind of a kind of a bigger guy I want to say is between 160 and 180 um but anyway and, and a little more lith than I am you know I'm I'm more fat than that uh anyway uh so he uh it was an interesting role we didn't he didn't really put me in a lot of danger um and what danger he did put me in it set me up for for ways to get him and uh, a couple of the things that I did though um Apparently it was surprisingly surprising enough that he got a really good laugh at it, and so that that's usually a good sign to me. It's like, oh wow, I wasn't even looking for that, you know. And so you know that that makes me feel like I might be getting somewhere with my jujitsu that I could, you know, do anything sneakily. You know, it's like you know building suave and panache with my my. Uh, my jiu-jitsu has been very, very difficult. I'm more, I'm more like a rhinoceros than, uh, than anything really agile or, <laughs> or fluidly moving. So uh, when I'm able to ooze somebody into a threatened position, uh, I, I feel good about it. Anyway, it is with that. I want to go ahead and throw down into some music because uh, right now I'm like practically naked, and I'm sure this would be illegal in some country or another. Um, And so as far as what to throw in for our first dance, Causality by The Contortionist here on Coin Metal. And that was Prong with Divide and Conquer. You know, and it's funny because I didn't actually pick that song intentionally like with with regard to any tie-ins. And, um... You know, one thing about this show is I've always sought to avoid, you know, talking down people or some. You know, I, I think that everybody has the opportunities to learn and improve on their perspective. And, you know, sometimes people just say stupid shit, including me. Um, but one of the things I caught this morning, and I, I was really, really not happy about it, um, was uh, I was watching something I, I think it was called block digest and it's these uh these kids doing a youtube channel 
you know, and uh, one of them was talking shit about Bitmain for for deciding to uh, not mine SegWit transactions. Now, you know, this this is an argument or an, and an issue that's been going on for about three years now, and some people believed that just because the number of SegWit transactions that were being included in the block was on the rise, and that uh, just because some of the miners had decided to go ahead and mine SegWit blocks, that the the discussion was over. We can just we can just we we can just march on ahead and plan to do whatever the fuck we want with all the work that the miners are doing. You know, we we can we can make them just some bullshit settlement layer, and on top of their their work, on top of the millions of dollars worth of fucking hardware and electricity and all that, they're just going to be happy with what fucking transaction fees we give them, and and we're going to use them as a base layer. To, to stack upon and we'll get all the transaction fees that they would have gotten if they would have processed the millions of transactions that we're going to be processing on the additional layers that we're just going to build on top of all of their work. And, you know, the idea also was, you know, what choice do they have? They have to do what we want them to do because if they don't, then they won't get the, the block rewards and they won't win. Well... I think that uh, somebody has a different plan, and uh, that somebody at this point it looks like is Bitmain. <clears throat> but anyway, like back to this thing I saw in Block Digest, and and like I said, I I'm really hesitant to call anybody out because you know what, we're all cryptocurrency users. However, when I hear somebody advocate for advocating that that you attack people for using blockchain.info's wallet because it doesn't support segwit and or lightning network um you've gone too fucking far Th- this whole industry is about choice and what that means is we don't have to do what you want us to fucking do we have a choice in the matter and you will not dictate to us, and you will not threaten to threaten us, and you will not intimidate us. And if you ever got up in my face, I'd break you in fucking half. That's bullshit. Compete. Don't fucking threaten me physically. Fuck you. Who the fuck are you? I I, I detest that kind of thinking. You, you don't have enemies here that you don't create. If you set to create enemies in, in the cryptocurrency space, you're going to find enemies here. You know, that's that's like the last thing I fucking say to anything to anybody about. Oh, yeah, go ahead and beat people up because they aren't doing what I think is the right way to do things. Fuck you. I didn't get into cryptocurrency so I can listen to your bullshit. I got into cryptocurrency so I could choose for myself which way to go. And that apparently is what Bitmain and Blockchain.info were doing. And another thing for this person that was talking shit about Blockchain.info. As a matter of fact, I I recall at one point or another, Blockchain.info was employing Andreas M. Antonopoulos. You know, kind of, kind of shows you that they're not, they're not some fly-by-night fucking group. Okay, he quit working for them, I think, back in like 2013, 2014. But the point being that he's a pretty smart dude when it comes to cryptocurrencies. So for you to be talking shit about them, like, oh, you know, these guys are assholes because they're not doing the right thing. Fuck you. Obviously, they're competent enough. If they've been in this space as long as they have, and they are one of the first wallet providers that was out there other than the QT wallets and Electrum and all that. But like in, uh, I want to say 2011, 2012, um, that's that's where I had my first wallet was blockchain.info. And, and for a while, that was pretty much where everybody had their wallets if they if they weren't hosting a regular old QT wallet or something like that. So... 
you know, again, for this person to be talking that kind of shit, fuck you. Who the fuck do you think you are? You come around here two years ago, and now all of a sudden you're, you're some sort of fucking expert. You don't know shit. Go back to the fucking dorm room you crawled out of. <laughs> anyway, let's get back into articles here. I got this one here, and it's it's right exactly what we were talking about. And I was actually um, kind of twained betwixt, you know, I, I didn't exactly know which direction I wanted to take this show until I saw this this article here, and it, it kind of reminded me of that episode this morning. I was like, wait a minute. They did mention Bitmain, and at the time, I I didn't think Bitmain would just say, you know what, we're not going to process SegWit transactions anymore, but apparently that's exactly what happened. And uh, I got this article here on Bitcoinist.com, and here we go. Why did Bitmain's ant pool stop mining SegWit blocks? And this is by uh, Wilma Wu, uh, authored October 31st, 2018, no indication of time zone, but 12 o'clock. Continuing on, Ant Pool. Oh, and uh, no penis. Ant Pool, the Bitcoin mining pool owned by hardware manufacturer Bitmain, has stopped mining segregated witness blocks. A question of charity. In a move which has sparked suspicion among cryptocurrency figures, data from the past seven days of block block mining shows that Bitmain mining blocks of under one megabyte, smaller than SegWit blocks mined by other pools. Quote, and pool is no longer, no longer includes SegWit transactions in Bitcoin blocks. One, one Twitter account confirmed October 30th. We're going to right click that. Quote, if there are enough non-SegWit transactions to fill up cores one megabyte, one megabyte base blocks and they pay higher fees than the SegWit transactions, why should it be charitable? The curious statistics contrast with Bitmain's desire to increase the, Bit- the Bitcoin block size limit as an alternative to the off-chain scaling options favored by SegWit proponents. The apparent conflict was not lost on the industry. The research team of Hong Kong-based trading trading platform BitMEX also highlighted the sub-megabyte blocks on Twitter. Quote, Despite Bitmain's strong support for larger blocks, Antpool has recently been producing smaller blocks, below one megabyte, while other pools produce larger blocks, staff commented. Quote, Despite Bitmain's strong support for larger blocks, Antpool has recently blah 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 blah. Is Antpool Bitmain excluding SegWit format transactions? Gosh, I hope so. Worst of both worlds. Reactions to Bitmex to Bitmex included claims Bitmain through though through excluding SegWit could continue to use the highly controversial covert ASIC boost mining technique it had previously claimed was quote not practical. Last month the company began rolling out overt ASIC boost no 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 no. La- last month Brains OS developed a way for them to have overt ASIC boost for its ant miner hardware family, a move which similarly drew suspicion from commentators. In a further nuance, mer- meanwhile, Blockstream's Wayne T- Togami noted that despite non-segwit blocks ostensibly having a higher fee attached, the blocks ant pool had, had chosen to mine, in fact, contain less in fees than the SegWit blocks it was avoiding. Bitmain continues to hold a monopoly on Bitcoin mining through control of Antpool and BTC.com, the latter regularly mining the most blocks on a given day. That means they're doing their job right. The proportion of transactions using SegWit had continued to climb in recent months, reaching an all-time high of 48% in early October before dropping. Oh, it dropped? Cool! Hey, um, one thing about the uh, number of SegWit transactions, uh, the, the thing that they're not bothering to tell you about that is that the number of transactions overall has shrank vastly, and that the the number of SegWit transactions has been relatively persistent this whole time, so what's been really going on is more a game of attrition than adoption. 
You know, they're they're counting on people stopping mining big block. I mean, uh, the regular transactions, you know, mining uh, legacy transactions as opposed to segwit transactions, and and I'm I'm sure they're just bloating blocks. You know, they're they're doing like smaller transactions, but they're doing them persistently because they want segwit transactions in the block. They want the miners to mine segwit blocks. Well. If the 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 miner with the most hashing power out there is mining non segwit blocks, that's going to be what the blockchain is. And uh, so yeah, you know, I I think that uh, people confuse Bitcoin for this like governed system that you can you can point at it and say jump and roll over and die, and, and, and it doesn't do any of those things. And the reason it doesn't do those things is because it isn't a dog. It doesn't follow commands like that. You know, and so a lot of these projects that I read about on this show, you know, they depend on on Bitcoin miners doing certain things. And, you know, they, they talk up all this framework, this and build that. You know what, dude? You're, you're building on quicksand. It's not even firm sand, it's quicksand. It looks solid, but it's not. It's ephemeral. It could change in a moment's notice. And then all of your framework is shit. You know, you, you just created a new reef out in the middle of a swamp or something like that. But you did <laughs> you know, you can't you cannot depend on the miners to do what you want them to do. And like I said, at any one moment they could they could just point at your shit and say, you know what, this is wrong. I'm I'm not gonna do this. Fuck you. And and, and you're screwed. All of the shit that you built on top of it is screwed. You know, this is why I've said all this time, you know, all these ICOs and shit, you know, rather than worrying about whether or not Ethereum is going to change in some way, shape, or form that is gonna completely fuck your project in the in the days to come, you should be building your own altcoin. You know, that's that's probably the most prudent move to do it. If you don't like the way that somebody else is doing things, or or the way that any of the projects that are out there are doing things, and you're you're looking at their mining algorithm, you're looking at their their dispensation or whatever, and, and you're just saying, you know what, I I don't want to participate in any of these coins, but I want to participate in crypto, and I think I can do it better. Quit listening to people that tell you, oh, it's already been done. Just fucking do it. If your shit is better, we will fucking notice. And if your shit is that much better, we will use your shit. And then you will get rich and and, and all that will happen. But it's not something where you get to tell us anymore. And I think this is one of the place, places where nation coins are going to have the most trouble. And uh, <laughs> we're going to get into that as well. But, you know, like I said, this, this whole thing that, uh, <laughs> you know, people are pissed about Bitmain switching off SegWit. I, I say good for you. Good for you, Bitmain. Good for you, Ampool. I think that, you know, they're, they're basically saying fuck you, we're not going to do the off-chain bullshit. And, you know, I think that's that's probably a wise move. Let me check something else here. I want to see here. I like that, that you know, if there, are, if there are enough non-segwit transactions to fill up cores, one megabyte base blocks, and they pay higher fees than the SW transactions, why should it be charitable? And, you know, it's probably more persistently one megabyte in in uh, non-SegWit transactions than it is in SegWit trans if you include SegWit transactions. Oh. <laughs> and, and this is cool. Jeffrey Lebowski says, The community over there is certainly not friendly towards them. Core did this to themselves with their refusal to raise the block size limit and discontinuing of SegWit transaction fees. Huh. I I didn't... Oh, discounting of SegWit transaction fees. Yeah, you know, um... They... 
they did do this to themselves. They thought that they're more important than the rest of the network. And I, I think in, in the longer term, they're going to find out that they were very, very wrong. <laughs> you know? And it, it's sad, because they've been in here for quite a while. Let's see here. So we're going to translate. Let me look at something here. I'm looking at the... Um, Looking up for the information for uh, SegWit transactions here. Eh, looks like it's back down to 40.778 transactions. And that that actually started on the 16th. That they uh, actually... The, the peak was at 48.23%. Uh, and uh, that was on the 7th of October, and then it just tanked. Um, I think it'll be really interesting, honestly. Yeah, you notice, though, that they were denied that 50%. Uh, I mean, it, it just came up to 48.23 was the peak. And then it just, nope, you don't get 50%. <laughs> so... We'll, we'll see how this this whole thing shakes out. You know, I think that over the longer term, that less and less favor will be put towards Segwit. I think that it, as more of the uh, more of the newcomers come online and they're able to look back and see how these people have actually operated, they'll probably notice that they weren't actually operating in ways that had consensus in mind like they gave a fuck about what anybody else said I mean because my, my whole impression this whole time has been that they're, they, they've got some like brain trust locked away in some motorhome somewhere and they're, they're hashing it out between them and then dictating from, to, from there to everybody else you know what's to happen and, and that they feel that that's their position in, in uh, Bitcoin and, you know, there, there was all this talk not so long ago about, you know, the tyranny of the miners. The, the miners aren't a fucking tyranny. You could be a miner. And, and now you're, you're, you're some fucking tyrant now that you're a miner? Fuck, fuck that idea. Mining is how you show confidence in a coin. You know, that's one of the reasons why I, I kind of discount the... Um, the importance of having massive warehouses full of full of miners is because you you don't necessarily need that to communicate your will. You can have a piece of shit miners. It's not necessarily going to make you a shit ton of money, but you might be able to to kind of uh, direct the will of Bitcoin by showing your will, putting some fucking skin in the game. You know, this is this is one of the things that Core has spent a lot of time rinsing out of the semantics and the memetics concerning cryptocurrencies. Is this idea that you can participate? The fact of the matter is, is that there is nothing prohibiting you from participation. You know, people out there. I I didn't read it on this show, but there was there was something on my Twitter the other day about uh, some guy in China got busted for stealing stealing electricity and mining with it okay that that guy has has taken the the no permission just a little bit too far but he's he's on the right track you know whereas he he probably didn't actually have a right to the electricity that he was utilizing and was probably utilizing the the uh, electricity of a government government office which often seems to be the case when they get busted. <clears throat> but the point being is he he did not allow the the permission that he would have <laughs> have had to get from the Chinese government to stop him. He just said, fuck it. I'm not mine. I don't have my own electricity. I don't want it to show up on my electricity bill. So I'm gonna set this up at, you know, the the IRS office that I work at and and mine away on their electricity. Like I said, it, it's a step too far, but the guy's got the right idea. 
you know, he should have taken the hit and just mined in his own home. But from what I understand, the Chinese government really isn't as friendly about cryptocurrencies as some would like to believe. I know that uh, there is a vibrant OTC market there, or are many, rather, um, because they, the people that are involved in cryptocurrencies in China want to stay involved in cryptocurrencies in China. You know, a lot of them, from what I understand, actually set up trade accounts in Japan where they really don't give a fuck. And I suspect the same thing will happen in South and, and North Korea. You know, they seem to be more intent on merging and becoming one Korea. I think that'll be really great for the whole region. Because they have they have kind of had a whole... I don't know, um, I keep wanting to say Zeshwan, but that's not it. Uh, like a, a um, yin-yang kind of relationship. You know, where the, the North was outwardly militaristic and, and military-focused... Whereas the South Koreans were more business focused. And now we're going to see more of a merger there. And I, I think intrinsically the North and South Koreans both love to fucking gamble. And are probably both really into the digital age. And it's just a matter of access. And as the relationship between South and North Korea solidifies starts congealing into a more unified stance with the rest of the world and themselves, I think that we are going to see another boost of mining because South Korea, they make a shit ton of computer chips. So, the the idea that they would uh, they wouldn't be a massive source of uh, of mining hardware is uh, it's kind of silly. I, I just that's just the way I see it, man. So yeah, the uh, the whole thing with uh, Bitmain saying "fuck your Segwit transactions," I say congratulations to you, Bitmain. Thank you for showing us that you still have a mind of your own, and that you do still have a, a sense of humor. Because I mean, really, if you look at that chart, they couldn't have planned it any better. <laughs> they really couldn't have. You know, I've been saying for a while now that. Uh, that Bitcoin needs to go 64 megabyte blocks or bust. And and I really do think that would be reasonable. You know, Bitcoin Cash is so, has shown us that 32 megabytes can be done. And as a matter of fact, I got this other article right here that I'd like to get into. And this one is about block sizes. Let's see. I accept. Yes, fucking cookies. Give me the goddamn article motherfuckers anyway here it is on uh, bitcoinist.com and, and this is funny because this guy just decided to block me recently on twitter which i'm kind of surprised about anyway continuing bitcoin core developer peter todd joined the backlash against quote fake news report about bitcoin's impact on global warming october 29th this occurred after multiple appearances in mainstream media publications. Nature's Naive Assumptions Originally published by Nature, the br- and that was my last episode was about that thing, the brief report claims that Bitcoin, Bitcoin mining could help increase temperatures by over 2 degrees Celsius within just 11 years depending on Bitcoin's rate of adoption. Quote, Bitcoin is a power-hungry cryptocurrency that is increasingly used as an investment and payment system. An excerpt of the payment uh, paper reads, Quote, Here we show that the projected Bitcoin usage, should it follow the rate of adoption of other broadly adopted technologies, could alone produce enough CO2 emissions to push warming above 2 degrees Celsius within less than three decades. While claims that Bitcoin is environmentally unfriendly often surface in the media, the Nature piece sparked controversy with some of Bitcoin's best-known figures. Not only was it data based on, quote, naive assumptions, but many of the mainstream outlets reporting on it failed to link to the paper itself. Coinmetrics.io co-founder Nick Carter noted, for this study to make sense, Bitcoin's issuance would have to become fixed with no decrease. All 
level two tech would have to be a it would have to evaporate, which I think is going to evaporate anyway. Bitcoin would have to scale up to three hundred and ten billion tons uh, transactions on chain, which is entirely feasible, by the way. Miners would need to use the local energy mix precisely, which is not likely, and blocks would have to be up to 3.2 gigabytes. Dude, if we couldn't get up to 3.2 gigabytes in three decades, there is something fucking wrong. There is, there, there's, there would be something terribly, terribly wrong. We did the math on this show, and it takes two minutes, and, and, and that is, of course, at max load, with, with 1.1 megabytes per second on our, our bandwidth. So that, you know, and the blocks are 10 minutes, so it doesn't, it doesn't take too much brains to figure out that, yes, you can do 32 megabytes pretty much everywhere on the fucking planet. 3.2 gigabytes... That's going to be a little more challenging. However, I would say that there will be a, enough places in 30 years that can do 3.2 gigabytes that it really wouldn't fucking matter. Continuing on. <clears throat> a small matter of 3.2 gigabyte Bitcoin blocks. Tan went on to call out those who repeated the report's findings without fact-checking as either incompetent or a fraud. That major, that major mainstream media organizations are reporting on this as a, is a scathing indictment of the MSM. It's simply fake news to publish, to publish as either incompetent or fraud, he added. <clears throat> According to Carter, the report's figures are so far from the truth that the Bitcoin network would look nothing like it does if it produced the emissions nature claims. Carter said the characteristics of the network would need to exhibit that would need to exhibit are 3.2 gigabyte block sizes, fixed issuance of newly minted uh, newly mined bitcoins, and scaling to process 310 gigabytes of transactions on chain. Carter added that added he he had himself attempted to estimate Bitcoin's future con- energy consumption, but his figures were quote not at a level of quality for him to share any findings at present. What do you think about Nature.com report? We did an entire fucking episode about it. We think it sucks, and yeah, bad science is going to tell you anything good. <clears throat> And, uh, yeah, you know, 3.2 gigabytes, we, we should be able to do that in 30, in 30 years. I would expect that we could probably do that within 11 years. Um, I don't know. I, I think that people, I don't know. I, I think that people just don't spend enough time actually using this shit. If these people did a, did their study, like, on real hardware... You know, and I mean, really, how hard would it have been? Go on fucking Amazon, buy a couple ASIC miners, bring them home, set them up, fire them up, and and let it roll. Do your ba- do your bases off of that. You know, do that for like two months. Understand the the corollary between your energy consumption and you know your heat and your CO two and all that. Do your study in a real manner. Maybe mine for a year. Get an idea for even having to roll over your hardware when it becomes deprecated and it is no longer making you enough money to continue. Pay attention to the kind of augmentations you do to your setup. You know, what kind of cooling systems do you switch to? Do they use up as much electricity as your previous ones? Are they as noisy as your previous ones? Which ones make the least amount of noise? Which ones were more efficient overall? When you do this... Then you will develop a, a better matrix, not, not a perfect matrix, but a better matrix to at least get a base idea of what your actual energy consumption will be over a year and then do your extrapolation off of that hard data. Not just, you know, let's look at some random figures and some, and some other papers that people did just as sloppily as this one and refer to those for all the shit that we don't want to write ourselves. Give me a fucking break, people. 
I think it was just a hit piece. It's a fucking psyop piece telling you don't get into mining. Well, I'm here to tell you get the fuck into mining, kid. Let's go ahead and throw back down into some music. In uh, as far as what... <sighs> Again, I have not picked anything else. But let's go with Anthrax because it's at the top of the list. And the devil you know here on Coin Metal. And that was Gizmachi with Burn. I guess one of these days they're supposed to actually come out with another album. They've been, uh, I don't know. I, I read somewhere that they were working on something, so I don't know if that means that sometime in the future it's going to come out or if they're actually still a band or, you know, what the hell is going on. Apparently they do play occasionally. Um, but yeah, I haven't been able to catch them live, which I imagine they'd probably put on a really fucking awesome show. Anyhow, as far as where else we're going to go, oh, look at that, somebody dressed as the white paper for, um, for Halloween. Excellent. Excellent. At least people remember where it all came from. And, uh, to some extent, I think we've fulfilled or that we are fulfilling on the promises put out in the original white paper. However, I don't believe that the off-chain TXing part of it was really, uh, really part of what he had in mind. Sorry, I'm trying to reach something way behind me here. But yeah, the, uh, the original white paper... I was going to read it today, but apparently a lot of other people have. Not only that, but this isn't actually the uh, 10-year anniversary of Bitcoin. Um, somebody else, uh, I believe it was Orbital Lexicon, was pointing out the fact that the network went live in like January, which is, I, I don't know, I think that's a more appropriate metric. Yeah, here it is. Um, where is it? Today is not Bitcoin's birthday. We don't celebrate birthdays on dates of conception, but on dates of birth. BTC still has two months to go. Sorry, the correct the correct tenth birthday for Bitcoin is January third, two thousand nineteen, at eighteen eighteen fifteen oh five GMT. So that would be six p.m. Yeah. So, yeah, that's the, uh, I guess that's the real, the real deal as far as the birth date of Bitcoin. <clears throat> but what it should mean for us now, I, I, like I said, I think looking back, um, we've already surpassed the actual promises of Bitcoin. And I do think that the the urge to try and build off off chain and all that shit. I think that's stuff to best be facilitated in house. You know, like if you're doing uh, if you're doing retail sales or whatever, that if if Bitcoin were to become enough of your business, that you would maybe uh, do a Lightning Network node set up for uh, you know for a week. You know where you figure out what your your weekly take is in Bitcoin volume wise for for amount of Bitcoin. You put that on your Lightning node, and then you uh, you work from there. Then you can actually receive that amount. I don't know. I I really don't like the whole. Um, I really don't like the whole thing. I I think that it's a um, it's a silly hack for to be trying to push to to people using. You know, uh, instead of instead of using just a regular old wallet, using that instead, I, I think it's kind of silly. You know, at least give me the opportunity, the chance to to say no. I want to do just a regular old standard transaction and be able to afford it. You know, that's one of the the lowered bars of entry that were available to us in Bitcoin originally. Was that transaction fees were were virtually free, if not free. You know, initially the uh, the transaction fee was considered a quote unquote tip. It was called a minor tip, 
and then it became a minor donation and then it became a minor uh, there was something else before it became a minor fee oh no no it became a minor fee and now we talk about it as a transaction fee see we're not even talking about minors anymore and, and that's a little bit of mimetic drift and it's one of the ways that they kind of corrupt things from the inside you know and when I say they I mean humans in general I couldn't identify a specific group or whatever because I'm not entirely certain who they are if I if I knew exactly who they were specifically I would I would point it out um, but yeah they uh, they change the the semantics and memetics discussed about it you know the same thing went on with the internet and if you were here for the initial years of the the internet you know its first decade of real public use um, you, you saw the same exact thing where where there was just this mimetic drift and soon enough we weren't talking about ourselves hosting our own our own web servers and, and letting people dial in through them no pretty soon we were talking about you know having uh, having an ISP that we had to connect through and and I thought that was really unfortunate because at the time you could get on to through uh, Kmart you, you know and, and I want to talk about that for just one moment there was a time when you could connect to the internet for free through Kmart I mean you want to talk about something that was really like 21st century thinking somebody at Kmart had enough brains to say okay wait a minute We'll, we'll allow them to get onto the internet for free, but we'll occupy this tiny corner of their, their desktop and, and we'll, we'll put ads on that. And that's how we'll pay for connecting them to the internet. And it fucking worked. All kinds of people use the internet through their service. It fucking worked. I, I, I participated in it. Um,. And, and to see the internet go from that to, you know, where we're paying like, you know, anywhere from 15 to, what is it, like a hundred or something, a couple hundred bucks a month, depending on how much your bandwidth is and where you're located. And I, I just, I think it's sad, you know, I mean, if we were to be able to continue on like that, where Kmart <laughs> was able to, to, um, provide the the ISP service that we need I mean shit you have two monitors right put the goddamn mo the the ad on the on the other monitor turn the monitor around so you're not looking at it done and done <laughs> I mean fixed but imagine where the internet would be today if we still had that that kind of access where companies that you know, say, say uh, even AT and T would be giving us free bandwidth, right, to do whatever the fuck we want with, and just occupy this little corner just in case we want to click on it and, and buy something at AT and T or through one of the one of the vast number of of retailers that are that are putting up ads through it. I I think we'd be a lot farther along than we are now, honestly. And it's, I think one of the things that slows down technology like that is regulation. And I, I did an entire episode where I was talking about, Agit, I did a uh, live read of Agit Pai's dissent against um, net neutrality. Honestly, I felt like his concerns were really conservative. And that the, uh, the greater effect that we've seen is a great chilling with regard to the desire to participate in the internet <clears throat> and I think that's unfortunate you know we're we're seeing this again with Facebook where they overstepped their hand same thing with Twitter you know where they've overstepped their hand with regard to what kind of access and what kind of control they have over the the media that they allow you to view through their their uh, mediums and uh, <laughs> you know I think that we're going to continue to see that drift until we start really embracing freedom, the kind of freedoms that are allowed or facilitated through the internet. I think we'd be due for much richer futures 
if we were to embrace that perspective. Blah, 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 blah. I was just looking at something that somebody had sent me here. I learned things I didn't know. Blah, blah, blah. I just talked to you. I just want to let you know maybe someone can troubleshoot for users visiting the site. Just heads up. It still doesn't load quite a while. Links, blah, blah, blah. Oh, I'm sorry about that. Yeah. Reload. Get a few as needed. I will check things on my end to see what I can do. Alright. Get that off of there. That's one thing about the internet. So much access. So where are we going to go from here? I do have this other direction that I was intending to go in before I took that little soliloquy off into fuck you about mining and uh i got this other thing that i that i had initially planned for and uh i'm gonna go ahead and go with it because ultimately i think it is connected in a uh in an off sort of way and and the direction i think it'll be made clear towards the end where they where the subject matter meets And so I got this um, Crypto New Media is the website, crypto cryptonewmedia.press, my apologies. No point of a central bank digital currency in Australia, assistant governor. And uh, this is by accepted here. <laughs> so uh, apparently uh, no indication of genitalia. And this was last updated on uh, October 24th, 2018. I, I'd actually planned on doing this previously, but... It just got buried under the stack of uh, stack of tabs. Anyway, here we go. Australia is not likely to see a central bank digital currency anytime soon, as the country's reserve bank is of the view that the existing system works well. Speaking at this year's Swift International Banking Operations Seminar, currently underway in Sydney, the Assistant Governor of the Reserve Bank of Australia. Michelle Bullock said that the Apex Bank has yet to find a convincing reason to create a digital version of the Australian dollar. According to the Financial Review, Bullock also added that the RBA is not interested in having a digitized version of the Australian dollar or for domestic use since the system already works well and users don't really need access to digital uh, to direct settlement in order for them to carry out transactions burden of proof however bullock pointed out that the central bank digital currency could play some limited specific roles through the fintech sector would bear the burden of proving the advantages of the new tech over existing systems quote we do have more of an open mind on the issue of wholesale and whether or not central bank digital currencies should play a role in assisting with perhaps supply chains cross-border, said Bullock. But it remains for industry to demonstrate to us really why what we have, what we have got available in terms of payment systems, including those still coming on board, can't actually deliver that already and, and you know what ma'am that's not really the test to, um, being made here <laughs> anyway continuing on though untested one of the touted beliefs of cbdc's four central banks is that the technology would allow reserve banks to run negative interest rates and thereby overcome the monetary policy problem known as the zero lower bound this is a problem experienced when interest rates are at or near zero, thereby diminishing the capacity of central banks to stimulate economic growth as the result of the resulting liquidity trap. Hmm. Flight to safety. However, even though CBDCs could solve this problem, at least in theory, they may also complicate the management of monetary policy and liquidity for central banks in times of crisis such as a bank run per bullock. 
This is because depositors would flock to a CBDC as they flee commercial banks seeking, quote, safe haven. That would, that would take liquidity out of the system and center it in the central bank, said Bullock. That might make the management of liquidity and monetary policy more difficult in those circumstances. RBA's stance on CBDCs stands in contrast to several central banks spread across the globe, which are exploring the idea of digitized versions of their national currencies. As previously reported by CCN, this includes Thailand under an initiative known as, quote, Project Ithanon. Ithanon, my apologies. Others are Norway and Sweden, two Scandinavian countries which are currently grappling with a problem of low cash usage levels. The Bahamas and Canada are also exploring CBDCs. So yeah, I've I've said before that I think that national cryptocurrencies could work. I do believe they could work. But here is the thing. The mining for them would have to be immutable and would have to be public just like any other cryptocurrency. And I think this is the challenge that a lot of other a lot of the projects that have been proposed and currently are in operation have failed on. You know, there there have been a few attempts. I think Nautilus Coiner, and like uh, there was another one for uh, Cyprus. I want to say Cyprus had a cryptocurrency, and there there were a few other attempts at this. It's not a new thing. You know, I mean, really, I I, I wish there was an actual history book or a history log, and, and one could be drawn up. I mean, all the information has been posted on the internet in one form or another over the last 10 years. So I think there is a way to kind of a put, put together a Wikipedia that is like exclusively crypto and like notes things like altcoins that have come and gone and the kind of projects that they were and what setups and why they why they ultimately failed or are failing or you know why they're currently in operation or you know so on and so forth that kind of thing. I think that would be useful for people. So I got this uh, article here on Cointelegraph.com, and this is kind of forwarding the uh, <clears throat> the idea that I had that we were going forward with. I appreciate it. None of it affects listening, but I wanted to let you know, no matter how many times I reload the same thing, I'll send you a screenshot in a minute. Internet connection is not the issue. Huh. Apparently somebody is having an issue with the website. Let me check something out really quick here. I just got to check and verify. Fortunately for me, I had the thing on uh, on kind of a quick load. <laughs> I, I I've loaded it so many times in my browser that it, it it's just there. I start typing it, and there it is. Yeah, there we go, and I can hear myself. So I am live. That is weird. I'll just try. I'm gonna go ahead and type this thing out, and then I'm gonna send it to her. If it is a her, I don't know. You never know with the internet. We, we, we could be boys. We could be girls. We could be attack helicopters. We You know, it's a matter of choice. All right. So, anywho, this is the next one that I wanted to cover. And we've covered this on and off. And I've said multiple times that I believe Venezuela is like a like a test bed. If we, if we wanted to guesstimate about the evolution of cryptocurrencies and how the relationship of the state with cryptocurrencies will evolve over time given a certain path you know mostly uh, mostly if the state were to take an adversarial stance towards cryptocurrencies we can kind of see how it'll play out everywhere else by looking at it in Venezuela and I say that with confidence because it seems like there's there is an average like trend you know there's there's a flow of behavior you know an arc of arc of activity <laughs> and it's um it, it's funny because the the same stimulus 
it doesn't matter where where it happens there's always the same response for it and and so it kind of it's kind of a reassurance that people are people you know <laughs> but anyway i got this one it's by anna berman so yes or no i'm sorry no penis and uh, this is authored 15 hours ago Venezuela offici- officially launches sale of controversial petrocoin for fiat crypto. <laughs> Venezuela controversial state-owned cryptocurrency, the Petro, is now available for purchase for fiat and crypto. Venezuela Economy Department announced on Twitter Monday, October 29th. According to an infograph infographic included in the tweet Petra can now be purchased directly from the country's treasury via the coin's official website from six crypto exchanges authorized by the government the state issued coin can be purchased for fiat specified in the graphic as yuan, euro and US dollars or for certain cryptocurrencies by legal entities and individuals who have registered and passed a validation process on the coin's official site. According to Petra's official Twitter, which has evidently been suspended as of press time, the coin has been, can be purchased with Bitcoin, Litecoin, Ethereum, and Dash. However, the National Crypt- uh, Cryptocurrency Association reports the Petro is currently only available for Bitcoin and Litecoin among cryptocurrencies. Uh, that's not true. If there's a way to transact it around, somebody will figure out a way to do it with another altcoin. The government has also assigned a superintendent of crypto assets and related activities, Josevelt Ramirez, <coughs> who is reportedly responsible for handling Petro's customer service issues. The six crypto exchanges, Bankar, AFX Trade, Cave, Cave Blockchain, Ambrose Coin, Cryptia and Cryptologo have been authorized by the Venezuelan government to trade the coin as of October 16th. As of press time, none of the exchanges is listed among the top 100 crypto exchanges on CoinMarketCap. Earlier this month, Venezuela's President Nicolas Maduro had announced the official date for the start of Petra's public sale would be November 5th almost 11 months after he'd first hinted at the possibility of a state-backed cryptocurrency. At the time, Maduro revealed that the Petro would be traded on six authorized crypto exchanges, though he refrained from naming them. In addition, the Petro wallet was launched the same day on Google Play, but has since been deleted. <laughs> You notice nobody bitches about the uh, the uh, censorship going on here. <laughs> I mean, I haven't heard any complaints about it. But yeah, so this is this is something that I predicted a while ago, and I imagine there are other countries that are trying it at least in the background. You know, whether or not they'll ever launch their projects, I think will be uh, will be very telling. But I don't think it's the government's position to uh, launch a cryptocurrency, honestly. I think that it's time that government goes back to being service-oriented as opposed to, oh, how should I say it, ruler-oriented. I think that cryptocurrencies are going to fundamentally change the relationship that we have with other countries. And I honestly believe that's already happened that cryptocurrencies, they've created a new kind of mad quagmire. You know, back in the, um, I want to say from the 50s on through the early 90s, late 80s, we had the Cold War. And basically this was a, uh, this was kind of a, I don't know, kind of a brinkmanship game where... Two, two superpowers couldn't directly conflict with one another, so they had to go at one another via proxies. 
and to some extent it's it's been fueled inadvertently by by our national crypto I mean our national fiat currencies and it's one of the things I think that's driven people into cryptocurrencies is the lack of desire to continue funding that and you know I, I've talked a lot about cryptocurrencies and how they displace monetary value and this is this effect as hasn't actually changed you know there's been the introduction of things like ICOs and and uh, stable coins to try and divert people's attention but for the most part people's eyes have always been on the prize of Bitcoin and you really got to be taking advantage of the low price that it's currently at I think I, I don't really foresee a time where it's really going to s- stay down where it is. <laughs> I mean, I, I really think that something is going to break. That that certainly now, you know, it, it's kind of funny when you when you think about Bitmain's uh, Bitmain's desire to shift away from Segwit and and how they expressed that recently um it's kind of interesting the timing because not so long ago blockstream bought a shit ton of miners and they fired them up and i'm sure that they were part of that 70 percent additional hash power that's come online since then and uh, i think that one of the one of the reasons there was a delay you know that that he waited so long <laughs> is that he was waiting to see how much hash power they would actually put on the network. And he's like, oh, okay, so you only have that much? I'm going to have to fire up another warehouse and I'll be able to cancel out the effect of all that hash power. And then we'll, we'll switch off of SegWit transactions and it won't be too long before people are supporting just me and are foregoing the SegWit transactions entirely. Fork! And you know that's that's a possibility that could be happening in the not so distant future that we see an unplanned fork, where Bitmain basically leads the rest of the network onto not supporting SegWit at all, <laughs> and then I think that they'll take it a step further, that they themselves will author their own version of Bitcoin that will have the block size increase that they believe that they can both handle and would be acceptable to the rest of the network and the rest of the users. Because I, I, this is one of those calls that has not been answered by Core in the last pff, three years. They've been off in La La Land saying, we're going to direct Bitcoin this way. This is the way that Bitcoin's going to go and you're going to do it the way that we want you to do it. Fuck what you want. Well, I think this is kind of a response to that. And there's something else that is not being conveyed to you about Bitmain's choice. It's not just Bitmain. <clears throat> it, there are other miners that, that are associated with Bitmain through Amppool. And so them continuing to, to support along with, uh, follow along with Jihan... That that's not just one man saying we're we're going to not support SegWit transactions. That's that's other miners saying that. That's you saying that. Or people like you, people like me, people like Jihan, saying we like Bitcoin the 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 way that it was when we signed up for it, and that's the way we want to continue to go forward. You know where we've faced network congestion congestion before the way we addressed it is by increasing the block size limit and, and the core just said no no we don't we don't want to do that well now we're now we're facing the issue and and i think that jihan is doing something very very interesting i hope that he's actually going to fulfill on it Meaning that he just continues to mine blocks without SegWit transactions in them. 
because the longer he can do that, the long, I, I believe the the better the chance that the rest of the network will catch on and will do it the way he's doing it. And if that does happen, the the one megabyte block size limit is going to cause some issues. You know, as as the usage does increase, as I as I do believe it will once this is ironed out that there's going to be a need for a block size increase. And, and so like I said, I think they might just develop their own their own little alternative GitHub and and uh, just go on from there and say, hey, if you want to mine this version of Bitcoin, this is the original version of Bitcoin before SegWit was added. So we're just going to continue on from there. If you want to jump on board, here we are. And, and I think a surprising number of people will just, just jump back onto that. It's a lot simpler. You know, the, there's been this urge to complexify Bitcoin <laughs> and basically it's to it's basically to raise the bar of entry you know to make it to where the average Joe can't go from hobbyist up to Jihan Wu you know that you, you got to stay in your dormitory you got to stay in your your parents basement <laughs> And you can't you can't go any further. You can't you can't climb on the ladder. Well, that's bullshit. And I think that's one of the things that Gian is saying to us with this little move. I I certainly hope he keeps it up because it is the way I think that we need to go. You know, by by going back that way, again we will face the issue of of increased transaction fees, and we'll be forced to face it. You know, do we do we want to try and bash our heads against the wall with this again or do we want to do the obvious thing and increase the block size I think I think option two is going to win out <clears throat> but on to more state backed cryptocurrencies and this one's <laughs> this one's going to bring a smile to your face I think ccn.com um, bitcoin economics one minute ago no it was longer ago than that. Got to reload it so I get an actual time. There it is. Uh, this is authored on October 30th, 2018 at 1721 CET. The U.S. government maintains a fork of Bitcoin. <gasps> the U.S. National Institute of Standards and Technology and other government bodies play a role in Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. For starters, SHA-256 and other hashing algorithms using, use, used in cryptocurrencies have been reviewed and tested by the Institute in the past. Independent cryptographers are frequently consulted by government agencies and scientists. The NSA and NIST occasionally conduct competitions for the development of new cryptographic software. The most recent winner was an algorithm called Kikak, but it is now most often referred to as SHA-3. The majority of hash functions that are submitted to these comp competitions see use, often wide use, regardless if they win or not. While the world's most famous cryptographers work in the private sector, it is fair to say that NSA and other government agencies provide decent career opportunities for up-and-coming cryptographers. NIST publishes paper suggesting managed blockchain with transparency. <clears throat> Peter Mell of NIST wrote, in a, wrote a paper in recent times called, quote, Managed Blockchain-Based Cryptocurrencies with Consensus, Enforced Rules and Transparency. The gist of the paper is there's a happy medium between public while blockchains like Bitcoin, which follow the laws of consensus and little else, and manage blockchains which give their permissioned owners an untrustworthy amount of paper. <clears throat> we demonstrate how to implement our approach through modest modifications to the implicit Bitcoin specification. However, our approach can be applied to almost any blockchain-based cryptocurrency using a variety of consensus methods. 
Yeah, whatever, dude. If you're managing it, what good is consensus? The implications are obvious. The blockchain could potentially be used by the governments to issue its own cryptocurrency. A a strictly public mining network and blockchain would obviously fail the means test for the government for multiple reasons, including the potential of a 51% attack launched by an unfriendly government. Actually, you'd probably be more concerned about it being launched by an unfriendly corporation. Anyway, continuing on. According to the paper, the features which make the Bitcoin protocol attractive to the government are its transparency and, of course, the inability to lose funds on it. But, they fail to acknowledge the fact that that's derived from public miners that have a choice in how they want to mine the Bitcoin and how that would affect their their plans. Anyway, continuing on. We provide a novel cryptocurrency architecture, which is a hybrid approach where a managed cryptocurrency is maintained through distributed open consensus-based methods. Key to this architecture is the idea of a genesis transaction upon which all other transactions are based and which enables the establishment of a hierarchy of accounts with differing roles. It is these roles that enabled us to introduce features from fiat currencies into a cryptocurrency, law enforcement, central banking, and account management, an excerpt from the paper explains. Quote, another novel feature is that the architecture allows the cryptocurrency policy to be maintained dynamically by currency administrator, but certain policy changes can be made permanent in order to facilitate confidence in the stability of the system. This is especially important for the relationship between the currency administrator and an independent community of miners, it added. (laughs) Yes, we have to know what we're mining in order to decide whether or not we actually want to mine it. Democracy is meant to be transparent and government agencies are supposed to be accountable to the people who elect them and pay for them. Current technologies in place don't always provide for this and there are plenty of opportunities for fraud, waste, and abuse in the government sector. And and to that end, you should just not even bother with it. The NIST version of the Bitcoin system makes only minor changes to the structure of a Bitcoin transaction in order to allow for the introduction of administrator policies, quote, roles, are introduced into Bitcoin transactions, enabling changes to be made in the protocol as a whole. Great. The paper explains that they are using the existing design which enables the spending of coins to additionally, quote, spend roles. Without getting too technical, it enables the manager of the blockchain to have a great degree of control over the entire pool of money in the system which makes it incredibly undesirable by comparison to publicly mined coins already in existence. That was my ad. Quote, The bin field operates similarly as before. In Bitcoin, the bin field field specifies a set of coins from a particular transaction already posted on the blockchain. However, the VIN field can also be used to bring roles into a transaction to authorize activities that require roles, which is most any activity in our architecture depending on the specific policy enacted. Functional, functionally, it is like we are, quote, spending a role to use it to authorize some action given that the usual use of a VIN field but roles can be spent an infinite number of times and are not transferred like coins. A VIN field can, quote, specify a former transaction where an account was given a role. In other words, you've just been deemed a criminal. Importantly, the design mentions a, quote, independent community of miners. Several aspects of the idea would require rigorous testing before ever seeing any real-world use. One example that comes to mind is the U.S. Treasury's blacklist and range of counties U.S. government and most U.S. citizens cannot do business with. These people would have to be banished from both mining and the possession or use of a U.S. coin in order, 
in order for such a project to be in compliance with U.S. laws. NIST tests ideas on its own Bitcoin fork. In addition to this paper, NIST has quietly maintained a fork of the Bitcoin software which attempts to integrate the ideas presented in the paper. Presumably, the software has only been run in government labs, but it could, in, it could inadvertently provide a, a boost to countries like Sweden, which are actively working towards developing their own national cryptocurrencies. The prospects of a government-backed cryptocurrency in the U.S. are likely years away, but certainly folks within the system have floated the idea multiple times. Government use of blockchain is, is on the rise, and the arc of history likely points towards cryptocurrencies being at the heart of all financial systems, but only time will tell what shape they will actually take. Aside from operating their own blockchain, governments could simply issue tokens on existing blockchains which follow the rules they decide to put in place. The options are myriad, but one thing is for sure. Traditional fiat-backed currencies are inferior to transparent and monetized digital, digital currencies and will eventually have to be updated. Mm -hmm. I want to check something really quick here. Yeah, apparently somebody's having a load issue. Oh, hold on here. Try another browser. <clears throat> Looks like you are are short a plugin that would facilitate your use of the station. All right. So, yeah, I'm playing like tech support here too. <laughs> So yeah, NIST, idea, NIST tests ideas on its own blockchain fork. You know, that's that's certainly a good way to do it. It's kind of like the equivalent of a test net. However, the, the problems that I see them facing are a lot bigger than I think they're, they're actually considering. You know, imagine for a moment that somebody figures out how to mine on their network without their knowledge. You know, how to, how to add an anonymous miner. And then they take that software and they they say add it the way that the uh, the way that crypto jacking is done on the on the the Monero network. I don't know what they've done about that or if there are still any attack vectors available for that. But the idea is there. And so imagine for a moment that somebody manages to infect millions of computers even for a short period of time and overcomes the quote-unquote miners that the U.S. government or other national government is using. Now all of a sudden there is going to be a grouping of miners that could be changing the rules of consensus without the government's knowledge or desire or permission. And this, this is an, ex, an existing threat it's one of the reasons why we are open and public. It's like, why bother to break into something that's open and public? There's no reason to break into Albertsons during their normal hours of operation. You know, we have, we have systems that are running 24-7. So, we're always open. It's like you don't break into a 7-Eleven because it's always open. You just walk through the door, Right? Now you want to try and do some bad stuff. There might be some bad stuff that happens to you in response. And the same thing is true with cryptocurrencies. Where if you are trying to introduce cryptocurrencies with an addendum of being able to alter the status of people's funds. Either in transit or in their wallets. I don't think that's going to bode well for you. Because all that would need to happen then is somebody that has the technical knowledge to become intent about their their goals, and then you're fucked. Because I guarantee you there'll probably be more than one of them. Anyway, so yeah, the idea of, of trying to do a government-based cryptocurrency I think is silly. It opens you up to a lot of vectors of 
of um, attack that aren't really suffered by cryptocurrencies. And actually, they are suffered by cryptocurrencies in the wild, but we resolve that shit quick. And one of the reasons we can is because fixing those things is also as open to the public as mining is. You know, so as users, we have an interest, and <laughs> and so if we have the competent, if we have the competency, if we have the capability of author, authoring the code that would fix something with Bitcoin, we'll fucking submit that shit. We'll write it up and submit that shit. We we've seen this happen between Bitcoin Core and Bitcoin Cash, where somebody I think in Bitcoin Core noticed a fatal fucking flaw in Bitcoin Cash, reported it to them. And they fixed it. The same thing happened recently with uh, with the C- CVE bug or whatever the fuck it was. I, I can't even remember the name of it. <clears throat> anyway, the same thing happened that a Bitcoin Cash developer managed to spot this bug and said, holy shit, I better report this before somebody exploits it. <laughs> and so, and they got behind the scenes and they fixed the shit. Or at least they tried to. They presented a fix, and whether or not the the rest of the network has adopted it has been a question. I, I haven't I haven't followed that up. I probably should. Anywho, so yeah, government backed cryptocurrencies, I think in the the longer term are going to provide prove to be a bigger problem than they're worth. That between the trading valuation of them on the on the open and public networks and the trust that's conveyed by the market in them i i don't think that they'll they'll travel very well against public cryptocurrencies like bitcoin but that's just me that's my perspective anyway let's go ahead and throw back down into some music and we haven't played any nevermore tonight and i love nevermore so that's what we're going to play next. <clears throat> but I haven't picked a song yet. Let's go ahead and throw down Born. So let me bring that up. Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? There it is. And this is off of This Godless Endeavor. Nevermore. Born. Here on Coin Metal. And that was Prong with Eternal Heat. Let it go on just one song too many. Kind of killed our opportunity for a, uh, a natural and lengthy closeout, but that's okay. There will certainly be Friday to come back to you. And it is with that, I'd like to thank you all very, very much for listening. Uh, as I said, we will be back again on Friday at 8 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. So until then, I'd like you all to trade safe. Do your homework and watch out for your own bunghole because nobody's going to do it for you. Not even NIST on their own blockchain. Thank you again for listening and y'all have an excellent evening. As far as our last dance, we're going to go ahead and go traditional here. little system of the down, of a down rather, bounce here on Coin Metal. Thank you again for listening and y'all have an excellent evening. <laughs>